This podcast is brought to you by Infinite Resources, a local staffing agency connecting diverse job candidates and central Iowa companies. Amplified. Welcome back to Black and Privileged in America podcast, power, love, and money conversations relevant to Black thriving, supported by Infinite Resources. I'm your host, Abana Sankofa. This episode, I will dive deep into legacy, into passing the baton. But first, catch Black and Privileged in America podcast on the Amplified DSM network, on the Amplified DSM YouTube channel, all social media platforms, and everywhere you listen to podcasts. Today, I have the distinct honor of hosting a truly remarkable guest, Representative Akeo Abdul Samad, a man whose dedication and service have left an indelible mark on both the Iowa House of Representatives and his community at large. As he prepares to retire after 18 years of service on Capitol Hill, we'll look back on his influential career as the longest serving black congressman in Iowa, his roots in the Black Panther movement, his impactful work leading a nonprofit, and his personal resilience in the face of profound tragedy. Also joining us is Reverend Rob Johnson, a local community leader and state congressional hopeful who is working to pick up where Akeo leaves off. Gentlemen, welcome to Black and Privileged in America podcast. Thank you for having us. A privilege to be here, especially to be with this dynamic host. <laughs> You're way too kind. Yeah, Thank you, Akeo. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. So, I mean, how are y'all doing? It, it, we, we're living in a tough time in the world right now. I just want to take your temperature and ask, how are you both doing? Well, personally, I'm doing horrible. Uh, horrible? Wait a minute. That's not what I expected you to say. <laughs> what is so horrible? <laughs> no, I, actually, I'm, I'm doing horrible because of the climate of what's going on in the world today. You know, if people actually realize that we have almost two-thirds of the world in war right now. And we have people who are dying, and we're talking about women and children who are dying not only in Palestine, but also in Sudan. Yeah. You know, not only in Sudan, you know, and, and we're looking at even in Bosnia, but here in the United States, we have such a disparity that the genocides of people of color has taken on a whole different, has moved to a whole different level that we don't even realize that a genocide is still taking place. So that's why I say horrible, mm. you know, because I don't know anyone who is aware or, or as they say, woke, you know, cannot be horrible at this time. Yeah, there is there is a lot to be concerned about. And it is hard to muster up a smile. As a matter of fact, I was watching something on TV with my daughter the other day. And she said to me, Mom, why is everybody so happy when it's really not that much to be happy about? So how do we, I guess we'll just jump right in. And Rob, I'll get you right know, to you. I just got to say this Yeah, sure, quick. sure. When I opened up uh, my speech, when we kicked off this campaign, I said to the crowd, I wanted to thank each of you for being here. Uh, not because you decided to come, but because showing up has become harder and harder every single day. Whether we show up for ourselves, whether we show up for our jobs, whether we show up for our babies, whether we show up for our community, showing up has become harder and harder every day. And so I just want to shout out the people who continue to show up, like the, I'm going to say, young man who is sitting right here with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, who continues to show up every day, even in the face of every single thing that is going on, right? I mean, look at what happened at what he had to sit through at the Capitol, where they cut SNAP benefits for people where now you're getting less than what you could have gotten. Uh, look at what we did, what happened to education. He had to sit through that. And then even if you watched one of his speeches at the Capitol where he said, uh, he said, you know, I'm offended because uh, we're talking about guns in schools and nobody came to speak to me about it when I am the one who has had to sit there with those families. I'm the one who has to get those phone calls 
with these families every time to talk about gun violence, but nobody came to me to talk to me about it. And then we passed something that is detrimental, not only to just us in our school system, but us as a state. And so showing up has definitely become harder and harder every day. I think you make a a very good point that showing up is harder for a lot of people. Um, And in my mind, I like to look on days past to see what lessons we can pull from our past, our collective national past, and say perhaps this can inform how we go forward. So with that in mind, I mean, we're, we're talking about the wars that you mentioned, Representative, the, the wars that are happening all around the world. Um, I think back to the civil rights movement and the freedom struggle and all that black people endured and, and um, all of the energy exerted to make a difference, to make a change, to slightly make things different, to move the needle forward. How do you think uh, those movements, including the Black Panther movement, uh, shaped your approach to legislate legislating and to community service because I mean somehow you found a path forward so how how do you think those movements shaped your your approach yeah. let, let me clarify something first if sure I may I don't know what to call you queen is that what I call you queen? <laughs> just call me Abena Abena yeah right. you know first first when I say horrible I don't want people to think that I'm just saying that things are so bleak as negative, you know, I, I believe that in situations, as you do in history, you look at the good, bad, and the ugly, you know, and if you understand the ugly, then the good will have substance, Yeah. you know, but you got to understand the ugly first, you know, because that's what actually is the tainting of the good, mm. you know, because we don't know how to set and draw a clear line of demarcation between our pain and our power. So that's why when, when I say horrible, I'm talking about uh, not only a state of mind, Mm. you know, I'm also talking about a world climate. Mm -hmm. So when I look at my days in the Panther party, I look at one of my lives that I feel I lived, you know, was the fact that, what I fought for in 1967, 68, 69, and 70, you know, I'm fighting now for in 2000, you know, 20, 24, 2023. The more things change, the more they, they stay, stay the, the same. same. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So it was interesting. And when, uh, when I gave a, a speech on the floor, I said, you know, what was interesting to me was that it's the first time, and I was excited. I told him I'm really excited, you know, and I said a lot of times you laugh to keep from crying, mm. but I said I'm really excited. That is, I didn't think I would ever be in the House of Representatives and see white folks start fighting for their rights in history. <laughs> you know, that, I chuckled, and, but that's kind yeah, of funny. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I was just so excited, you know. I said now you're starting to see what we've been fighting for for decades. You know, you're fighting for truth in your story. Mm. We're fighting just to have our story told. So, you know, so when we talk about the Panther Party and to this day, you know, I, I, and I tell people, and I, and I tell this to Rob and others, you know, I don't consider myself a good politician at all. You know, I'm a community activist and I'm a peacemaker. I use the political aspect to be able to further those causes, you know, to be able to do that. You know, plus, I understand, I like politics. Politics is not bad. It's the people who mess up politics. You know, politics, democracy, if you do it right, we wouldn't have to have this this podcast like it is today, educating people. You know, we would be talking with you about publishing books and you know, being able to just educate people on how to make money and stuff like that, but we can't because we have such a disparity, you know, in this country that we have to talk about these issues that you're, that you're bringing up today. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. I uh, mean, do okay. you consider yourself a hometown hero? And I asked this because I made a Facebook post, and I wanted people to share who their hometown heroes were. I, a few come to mind. A.K.O. Abdul Samad, Sekou Mtiari, Kalanji Shadiq, 
Hadashah Maryam, Jonathan Narcisse, Wayne Ford. Like I, I have a list of a short list of hometown heroes that I can spout off to anybody who asks me. So, you know, people say wonderful things about you all the time. Do you consider yourself a hometown hero? No, not at all. Why not? You know, cause, cause you know, I, I think to the point I consider myself a servant. I'm a servant, you know, and you know, Mark Twain, who is, I want to be real clear because people are misunderstanding that. Mark Twain is not my favorite person. He just has some quotes in a book, yeah. you know, because he was a racist. So anyway, the, the key is, is that Mark Twain said there are two important days in your life, the day you are born and the day you find out why. I was blessed at 10 years old to find out why, that I was supposed to be here, and that was to be a servant, and my sister helped me do that. What happened you at know, 10? At 10, it... I lived, my sister's five years younger than me, but I lived in a neighborhood that now is the Sherman Hill area, but used to be the black community. Yeah. Okay, Center Street and everything, boy, they was popping. Yeah. But, you know, and I loved it because I was a kid and I could see, you know, man, I could see my goal models. You know, I saw them Saturday night. You know, drive up in, that's when they had the cars made out of steel. You know, oh, yeah. The Eldorados, <laughs> when you turn the corner, you got to wait for hours to catch up. <laughs> you know, they, the, those were the good days. And we would sneak down Center Street. But these individuals were living life. Mm. They weren't letting life live them. Yeah. See, and that was the difference. But, you know, at 10, my sister came to me, and I was 10, and my sister was five, and she was getting ready to turn six, and she said, Kayla, I don't have a bicycle. You know, she said, I go and see kids with bicycle. And it dawned on me, wow, my sister ain't got a bicycle. So I walked around the neighborhood, 10 years old, and I noticed most of the kids in my neighborhood did not have a bicycle. And I said, this ain't right, you know. So being an energetic entrepreneur, uh oh, what happened? Wait a minute, energetic entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, that's what I call it. You know, and also, you know, having a little, you know, what do they call it? You know, vision. Mm -hmm. You know, I went out in the area that I saw people riding bicycles, and there were several houses that would have two, three, four bicycles. I didn't realize that. <laughs> Uh, I agree that everybody should have two or three bicycles and you had a whole community that didn't have none. Hmm. So I just helped them donate. Oh, okay. Like Peter Pan. Well, yeah, but you know, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I, I questioned him, but anyway, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. True but story. No, I did. I just, so I would help myself to some of the bicycles and in my basement, I have many parts of many bicycles, and within, i say, three months, not only my sister had a bicycle, but everybody in the neighborhood had a bicycle. You know, and, you know, and, but I realized then everybody in the neighborhood had a bicycle but me. I never put me a bike together. I never used my skills to do a bike for myself, and I realized it wasn't about me. It was about helping people. Okay, so to your point, I want to ask you this because you've been a legislator for 18 years. You've 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 spent so much time um, professionally in your work on the Hill and in your work at the nonprofit Creative Vision and your personal life, just giving your time and your talent and your treasure to people. Um, so reflecting on that story that you're telling about making sure your sister and other children in your neighborhood had a bicycle and then realizing that you didn't have one, where have you kind of shortchanged yourself in your adult life? Because you've been giving so much to so many. What are you not giving to yourself that you're looking to do in retirement now? One of the things, and I tell people and I speak on it because I think especially black men need to talk about it it actually led me into depression. Hmm. You know, um, part of that is that I realized that it also helped me develop my 10 steps on how to turn your pain into power. That's the book that you wrote, yeah? 
The book, no, the book I wrote was, you know, actually was a deeper truth, Revelations of the Soul. Oh, look, me, I'm trying to give you another book. Yeah. Look. <laughs> no, the, the next book is called The Journey. Okay. And we're dealing with that and the depression and that type of thing. But the key was I didn't, I wasn't honest with myself, and I refused to accept that I was depressed. You know, I had to start being honest with myself, and I, then I had to start learning how to love me, you know. I had not loved me because in the Panther Party, we were not taught that. We were conditioned that every program that we start was supposed to be started and then turned over to the people. That's from the radio station, the free breakfast program, every clothing program. That's the way we were taught. And I realized that the majority of people in leadership in the Panther Party that I was with, I mean, uh, None of us had real relationship, individual relationships with individuals, you know, because our focus was the struggle. You know. So now you look at three, three years ago when I realized, you know, there was something wrong. Three years ago. Yeah, three years ago. And I'll be saying this is three. recent. Yeah, it's very recent that I started starting my succession plan to retire actually four years ago. And I get two years on the house and two years at Creative Vision. And because I needed to deal with me because I was being hypocritical. Because I could come to you, I could come to Rob or anybody else, and I could tell them how to turn the pain into power, but I wasn't doing what I was saying and helping other people do. Wow. And so I had to realize where I was at, and I did the first time that I sit in the middle of my floor in a long time and just started crying, you know. And I had a reaction, which is one of the uh, 10 points in my program. I had a reaction that you got to realize the tough days that you have, and you got to identify that and write about it. And I was sitting in the cup because what has happened was I saw one of my son's former girlfriends, and she came and she said, Mr. Kao, she said, I'm alive because of you. Mm. And she said, I wish a K.O. had a listen. You know? and, and so I went home that night, and I didn't know it, it triggered something within me. And I went home that night, and I just sat on the floor, just bloom, plop, and tears started coming down. You know? And so now I had to realize what was the trigger. I had to analyze that. I had to understand what was hurting inside of me, identify that, and start dealing with that. And that's when I realized, you know, in 50-something years, going on 60 years, I had never dealt with me. Did you have someone to help you go through this, or you did all this by yourself? I did it by myself because, see, that, and it is all in the book, but real short, I when I first started, I started thinking about going to somebody. This was years ago because people would tell me, you need to go to somebody because you're internalizing all this. Are you talking about like you know, therapy, a yeah, counselor? exactly. And I did. I went to a counselor. And my my counselor, I ended up, you know, went to an event. I went to an event. And this sweet, she was just as sweet as she could be, older lady, senior, you know, came up to me. She said, can I hug you? I said, yeah. So she gave me this great big hug, you know. And she was strong, too, boy. You know, so she gave me this great big old hug, and she looked at me, she said, and she grabbed me by the hand like this, and she said, I'm sorry of everything you're going through. Oh, yeah. And I looked at her. Yeah. I said, what do you think I'm going through? And so she started repeating some things that I had told my therapist, and only my therapist knew. Oh, so this, this is a therapist who broke your confidence? Broke my confidence. Oh, that's terrible. And the, the literally, and I said, who told you that? She named the individual. She said, well, in our women's group, she was just so excited that she was helping you, you know. And I just look, and, you know, after that, you know, one you thing you find out, and I say this to, to Rob especially, and a lot of us, we put on a mask anyway. We, we walk do. outside with a mask. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a mask. But you have two masks. You have what I call your first mask is your mask, is your Michael Myers mask, you know. The second mask is a mask that you put on so you can face society, you know, so you can smile at, like you smile at Rob knowing you don't want to smile at him, you know, that type of thing, <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't yeah. think people feel yeah. like that. Yeah, oh, they my. do. Well, but yeah, anyway, yeah, they do. 
because he's running for office. Yeah. So, you know, but the, the key is that's the mask that we put on that we portray. The Michael Myers mask is the one that we put on to hide our feelings from people we love. So we build a wall. So my wall from that event went up tenfold. So I never allowed anyone on the other side of that wall. And if you got close to that wall, then I would stiff arm you so you would get back because I didn't trust anyone coming over that wall. Well, I just want to speak to the mental health professionals that are watching and listening today. Y'all need to watch it. We are coming to you for help. And I know that things have changed, times have changed, but remember, confidence is everything. Thank you for sharing that, Akeo. It is. And, you know, so that's where I'm at now. Yeah, and so yeah. I had to realize, you know, that I had to change my circle of people. You know, I had to then look at who do I really trust. And then I had to put them in the category that they fit in because I know everyone has their own issues. So it's like and I, their own agendas and their own agendas. Mm-hmm. So I meet people where the issue is, and I meet people where their agenda is. You know, and I now determine what comes into me. So you've taken control. Total, total control now. Well, I mean, kudos to you for taking care of your mental health because so often, especially in our community, it's a taboo subject, particularly yes. for Black men. Yes, y'all supposed to be strong. You're not supposed to cry. You're supposed to bear every burden. You're mm-hmm. supposed to run and see about us when in, in the late in the midnight hour yes. we're calling you for everything. But kudos to you for even if it was by force. Mm-hmm. Just in that moment where you had to cry it out, yes. kudos for you for for leaning into that and doing the work that it takes to to get better. Yeah, and and that's why I, you know I tell people now in my workshops that I do and that type of thing that once the first step to going from pain to power is to be honest with yourself, and that's one of the hardest steps to make. You know, so every night. Seriously, every night before I even crawl up in the bed, I get in the mirror and I say, okay, what was good today that you did? What was mediocre today? What was bad today? So the good and bad and the ugly, I go with me, you know, and I take my, I'm able to take my mask off, you know, and I'm able, and now it's very seldom I put my mask on. Because it's okay to be you. It's okay to be me. Yeah. And it's okay to say the things that come out. And the thing is, if I offend anyone, I tell them, you know, I'm not coming at you to offend you, but if you are offended, that's your issue. It's not yours. That's, my it's issue. that's not my issue. Yeah, yeah. Because you have a choice to accept me for who I am, you know, or reject me, whoever I am, you know, just as I have that right with you. You know, like people have come to me, and, you know, if I can segue just for a minute, people go, why did you endorse Rob? Because I wanted to. Right, and that's one of my questions. So thank you. Yeah, because you wanted to. Yeah, because I wanted yeah. to because he has proven to me, you know, his commitment to this community. He has proven to me that he's not here just to feed his ego. But let me be clear. He got an ego. <laughs> you know, he got an ego. But who in the room doesn't? Yeah, we all have one. Yeah, it's how you manage yourself. And I call this the community of self up here. So you got to learn to manage your ego. You got to learn to manage your conscious. You got to re- learn to manage your self determination. You have to manage you, your emotional roller coaster that we all are on. What was one of probably, how do I want to ask this question? What is the most unexpected lesson that you've learned? in leading Creative Visions, the nonprofit organization that you founded. What's the most unexpected lesson that you learned? The most unexpected lesson that I learned at Creative Visions was the night my son was killed. Um, That lesson (coughs) was, am I who I say I am? That's one thing I had to learn is who are you? Uh, That night, I called 10 people on the telephone because I needed someone there. Nobody showed. Hmm. I ended up driving up to Creative Visions and realizing my son's name was going to be on the wall of 
that mirror. And I went home and left the door wide open, just wanting somebody just to come by. I didn't want to talk. I just wanted somebody sitting there because now I was questioning who am I? You know, because I just see my son with a hole in his chest. You know, I just got through hugging the young man who killed my son. You know, I needed to know who I was. Was this a sign for me to step away? Was this a sign now for me to go into work and be who I feel I was in my principles? You know? And that night I set up, seven o'clock in the morning, right around, I went and took a shower and knew I had to go to Greater Visions because there was like 20 something young people that was waiting for me to come to work. And I had to either walk in there with a serious mask on or I had to take my mask off, both of them, and be real with them. Because as soon as I got there, they started telling me how Kale really wasn't dead, how Tupac wasn't dead, and I learned to listen to them. My son taught me how to listen. I would imagine that sitting there and listening to those young people share, you know, he's not really gone. He's not really dead. That had to be incredibly painful for you to hear. It was very painful. That's why I had to learn that lesson on how you turn your pain mm. into power. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was learning. I didn't know I was learning at that time, you know, but through God, I, I was learning at that point, sending on the, my part of the journey, you know, was this is what my, I had to learn, you know, how do you deal with this pain? Now, do I internalize it and not deal with it? Or do I keep it in the open, keep it on a conscious level and deal with this pain? You know, and see, understand in dealing that way, it took me two years before I even shed a tear, you know, and I, and when Rodney, his mother called me and said, big, okay, you're the only one who keep my son alive. They're talking about killing my son because he shot your son. You know, I talked to him. You know, I came back, I dropped to my knees, and I said, this pain inside of me, because it was starting to eat at me now, mm -hmm. you know. And so I got my staff, and I said, call a press conference. If anybody did that, I sent part of my staff to go pick up Rodney and his mother. And when they walked in the door, we did the press conference, and I said, this day I forgive this young man. Wow, oh, man. For shooting my son. Yeah, yeah. But what I will not forgive if anybody would hurt him. And then I took him and let him live in my house for two weeks while I prepared for the funeral. Okay, hold on, wait a minute. Let me not put no pimping in it, but good Lord. So you forgave the young man who shot your son. Correct. And allowed him to dwell in your residence. Correct. For two weeks. Correct. So did you ever answer that question? Are you who you say you are? I did. I, I answered the question that, I really believed in what I was doing. It wasn't for ego. It wasn't for anything else other than that. I believed that Mr. Farrakhan, we were having dinner one day, and he looked at me, he said, brother, you got to love our people more than they hate themselves. And I realized what that meant now. When he said it, I didn't have a grasp of it. That night, that day, I got a grasp of that we have to love our people more than they hate themselves. And the space when you realize we're living in a society that is conditioned to have people hate themselves so that the people in power can have control. So when I was able, you know, Abinanda, to realize that, then as I answered that question, then I was able to deal with that. It wasn't until two years later that I realized the different levels of forgiveness. And that was, uh, it wasn't the easiest part because when that came to me, I was doing a live TV program, national TV program, and I'm sitting on the stage with Larry Elder on a national TV program, and we're talking about creative visions, and one of my, you know, Clients, you know, at Creative Visions, they are talking about what Creative Visions did. 
And so Larry Elder, I'm sitting right next, just close. Larry Elder looked at me, he said, tell us about your son. So, you know, I started talking about my son. They put up this picture of with my son. And he got in the part about Rodney. And he said, when was the last time you seen Rodney? And I said, well, you know, I said, it's been a couple years. You know, They said, how would you feel if I told you Rodney was here? Wow, okay. And you talking about some mental gymnastics? I uh, Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sitting there, and the camera's rolling, and I'm looking at the camera, and that's when, you know, you smile to keep from crying. Mm -hmm. But this time I wasn't smiling to keep from crying. I was smiling to keep from snatching Larry Elder up out of his seat, you know, because I wasn't ready for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and so he looked at me, and he said, Rodney, stand up. And I didn't even recognize him. And he stood up, and then, you know, I said, you know, in my mind, I'm saying, that's him, you know. And, you know, all my feelings from my son's death flew back into me. It triggered everything there. And I literally sat there and envisioned him laying on that gurney with a hole in his chest. I envisioned that when I was sitting in the police car, Rodney, that Rodney asked me how little K was doing. And I said, little K was dead. And he went to hug me, and I hugged him. He said, I didn't mean to kill him. You know, all that flashed right in front of me, you know. So they took a break, and they brought Ronnie up. And, you know, so Ronnie came and hugged me and gave me a box and stuff, you know. And so I hugged him, you know, well, on national TV. So it was afterwards that my next lesson came. And what was that? And that was about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Because they had a limousine. They had this place to go to dinner and everything else. And I told Larry Elder and I told Ronnie, I said, I forgave you for killing my son. But I'm not at the level of forgiveness to go eat with you, to go have a drink with you, to share a limo with you. I said, I have not reached that point in my life that I can forgive you to that level. I can forgive you to the level I don't want to see you go to penitentiary. I don't want to see you hurt. I don't want to see nobody doing nothing to, excuse me, your family. But I can't go eat with you, brother. I haven't reached that level yet in my life. And that's when I learned the different levels of forgiveness. You know, and that's when I also learned it's okay. Because that way you're not playing games with yourself. Right, you know? right, right, right. So I, I went to Perkins Elementary School here in Des Moines, and I was in the fourth grade with your son. With a K. Mm. We were fourth graders together. Yeah. And he used to pick on me and I used to pick on him. But we, you know, as we matured, we got to be cool. Yeah. And he was um, he was a character, so funny, so well loved, so liked, and he was so popular and so cute. He was so cute. But this was your only son. This is my only biological child. Your only biological child. Yes. So Switching gears kind of to you, Rob, you have a young son. I do. You have a little boy who is so beautiful Thank with you. the mm. brightest smile and the biggest eyes. Um, the work that AKO has done over the last many, many years, um, approaching two decades, and even longer than that, before he got on Capitol Hill, because that's just one part of a large, large story. Um, it, it, a lot of it centers our youth the work he's done at the nonprofit, the work in education, the work um, battling gun violence in our community. And I'd, I'd be interested to know, to know that with your young son in mind, how do you plan to pick up where Akeo is leaving off? Well, I always tell people, you know, um, nobody can be Akeo. For sure. This is true. You know, <laughs> you know his retirement from... The uh, from the state house is almost like Shaq retiring from the NBA, right? Shaq retired from the NBA and and then went to go comment on the NBA, right? <laughs> oh, um, are you going to be the next political commentator <laughs> for one of the networks again? And, and I That'd mean, CNN something. may be calling. I yeah. mean, this is the longest serving black representative in the fifth whitest state in the country. Yeah. Um. So he has seen some things. He, you know, he could speak on things that other people can't and don't have. And so the legacy that he has left behind, uh, even listening to him talk right now, the legacy of compassion, the legacy of forgiveness, uh, the legacy of understanding, uh, but, but even most importantly, as, as we all know, uh, 
the legacy of going through things and showing people that it's okay. You will go through things, but you can come out of them just as well as you go through them. And so uh, he always says something to me. And truth be told, uh, when Eli was first born. Eli is your son. Yes, Eli is uh, my two-year-old. And uh, when Eli was first born, I, re- I remember when he was a baby and Akeo met him for the first time. And Akeo looked at me and he said, man, hug him tight. Hug, hug the baby tight. I said, okay. And even today, I, I talked, I, I call him probably almost every day at this point, probably twice, three times a day at this, at this point. Um, but or hours. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he's a busy man, Rob. I'm sure he has things to do. Trust me, I know. I, I know. Um, and even today when we when we spoke, uh, Eli was in the back. And Eli is now getting to the point to where he's he's talking. You know, he's, oh, that did, that did, papa, papa, you know. <laughs> and, and just like Don't he, whoop the baby. Don't whoop like him. Just like he said, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, Akeo said to me, he said, uh, he said, hug him tight. Hug the baby, give give the baby give the baby kisses and hugs and 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 honestly it 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 reminds me every day that uh, sometimes even when it's tough we push through not just because of ourselves but because we got to hug these babies tight we got to push through for these babies because it's an opportunity for them to see something that they may not see elsewhere and they I. And I'm, I'm going to personalize this one. I have an opportunity to raise a little black boy into being a black man, God willing, and that he will have the opportunity to see what I didn't have the chance to see. And what is that? A black man right there in the house, having somebody right there with you, pushing you through, having that opportunity. Uh, you know, I always tell people, my mom is the apple of my eye. Uh, when she passed away in 2014, I have never felt so naked in my life. And let me tell you, I was like, whew, this feels, this feels weird. Right, because you're covering <laughs> yes. your mama, your dad, your whatever, whoever, whatever the yes. makeup of the family is, that parent is your covering. And let me tell yeah. you, but my mother said something to me before she passed. She said, she said, son, I can do more for you as a spirit than I can in this living body. Mm. And, and you know, for me, it's like, okay, how do I embody all of that my mom has taught me, what I have learned from people like Akeo, from Betty, from Renee, from Mary, and, you know, uh, even from some of the some of the people that are closer to my age, like Deidre, Shekinah, right? Like what? What have I learned from Marvin and all of these folks? Right. And so for our listeners who are not familiar with the the Iowa, Des Moines, Central Iowa community, Rob is name dropping some heavy hitters and change makers <laughs> in our community, politicians and community leaders. But then I think about this, too. I know what I'm doing, but Abana is an author. So one day. Eli may say, I want to be an author. And so w- what I've learned watching and growing in this space is it's good to be able to have people who are in different spaces so that when something does happen or if something does happen or whatever the case may be, there are folks that you can reach out to and it all goes back to this village. He taught me. So if anything, the legacy of building and growing a village so that you can get things done around, whether it be, for the city of Des Moines or whether it be for the state itself, it's an opportunity for you to be able, there is nowhere. And I say this boldly, there is nowhere in the state that you can't go that they haven't heard of a KO. Oh, for sure. Everybody knows the, who this man is. Everybody knows. And, and so it doesn't matter whether it's in Davenport, Iowa, or, or Sioux, on a farm or, or Sioux in, City. in Runnels, Iowa. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. You know, and they, they know him in Red Oak, just like they know him in, in Ottumwa. And so build and watching that and watching those relationships, it builds an opportunity for us to say, all right, how do we maintain this ecosystem, this these moments of networking where if we need to get something done, 
yeah, he may have retired from the the state house, but if we need to get something done, we have the opportunity to pull on these networks to be able to get things done, not for ourselves, but just for the people in whom we serve. And it didn't matter where they lived in the state. I mean, there's even phone calls he get from folks outside of the state. I'm sure this right? man is a AKO. We're talking about you like you're not here. Like I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> but you are a, a, a national presence. I mean, you have to know that. And I know we've only got a few minutes left, so I've got another question for you, Rob. And then I don't know. We gonna see. We might have to have y'all come back because it's it's just not enough time. Would love to come back. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So. There are so many issues um, that Akeo alluded to, um, and I think even you did at the beginning of our of, of our time together, um, that our state is grappling with right now. We're talking about education, guns, and I mean education to the point of like funding, private, charter, all of these things, guns, arming teachers or not, you know, licensing and training, and we had the Perry High School uh, mass shooting occur and then we've got the economy that's huge taxes inflation jobs minimum wage like that hasn't changed in forever um, we're talking about reproductive rights in our state um, that's even gone to our state supreme court affordable housing is an issue but it seems like every time there's a housing um, some remedy that it doesn't go to the people who need it most it goes to people coming in with new jobs like what and then we have the cannabis fight whether to legalize it or not and use those taxes to answer some of these other problems so I guess my question if you can answer it in a nutshell what emerging issue do you think Rob deserves more focus if you win the election which issues do you think deserves more focus on the hill I'll tell you this um, I always start with mental health Right now, Iowa is 51st in the country, and there's only 50 states. Uh, we are 51st in the country when it comes to mental health, which means that if something happened to you or your family member, you would have to either go all the way to Sioux City, which is four hours away, or you would have to leave the state. To me, if we start with the mind, then we can start focusing on other things because even if we send our kids back into the schools and we fund the schools properly, but yet our babies are still struggling mentally. Are we doing them an injustice by making sure that they don't have what they need from a mental health standpoint? Mm -hmm. Even if we were to give small business owners and help people, because on, on, on my pamphlet, you can see it says uh, one job should be enough, right? Even if we was to make sure that people had what they needed, they had the resources. But if I give an untrained person $100 compared to a trained person $100, how far do you think that $100 is going to go to the trained person or the untrained person? When I say that, I mean, like, are we giving people the tools necessary to be able to sustain what is coming and what we could do if we were to get it? Because if we don't fund mental health and some, we give somebody, we give somebody a hundred bucks and now all of a sudden it's, it's gone in two minutes. Now, trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm using a hundred as an example because, hundred dollars is definitely gone in two minutes. Yeah. It days. doesn't go very far uh, anymore. It's, it's, I mean, what you get some, you know, some uh, you know, deli meat and yeah, some yeah, cheese let me and tell you, you spend a hundred dollars. I went to the grocery store this morning and let me tell you, it was, it, it was pitiful, but I know you should buy some more lemonade when you get to the store. <laughs> but it, that's a side note. Side note. And then, okay. But th that's a nutshell. We are running, running short on time. What else, what else is emerging that deserves I would more say, attention? Uh, schools, reproductive freedom, mental health, one job should be enough housing crisis. And then, of course, we got to make sure that we're looking out for our small businesses. Um, man, our unions need help. Folks have to be able to, to, to say, hey, I need to take time off and not have to worry about if their job is going to be there. And I'll say this about reproductive freedom. However you feel about abortions, I tell people this. At the end of the day, it's between them, their God, and their doctor. It's not for us to legislate or decide what people do or don't do when it comes to their reproductive freedom. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I appreciate that. I'm sure some of our listeners do as well. And when I have you come back, I'm, I'm going to give you some challenging questions on, on some of your issues because I think uh, 
um, since you are the, the the voters will have the final say. Absolutely. And for them to be able to understand the nuances around the issues you support would be a good thing. How can our listeners learn more about your campaign? What's your website? Yeah, they can go to Rob Johnson for Iowa dot com. Rob Johnson for Iowa dot com. And the four is spelled out. F.O.R. F.O.R. Perfect. Thank you. Um, one final question for you, Akeo. Um, gosh, I'm telling you, y'all are coming back. I don't know. It might take me six months to make it happen again, but we're going to do it because there's not enough time and I have 17 billion questions. But what advice do you have for Rob as he pursues this political career um, and hoping to carry the mantle that you that you have um, that, that you're hoping to pass along here? What advice do you have for him? Uh, the advice I have for him now is, you know, one is that put people above politics. That's the first thing. Secondly, be honest with yourself. And don't take away that family time that you need Mm -hmm. to give to your child. Because he, your son, will keep you grounded as long as you are there and honest with yourself and honest with him. Because it's going to be some long nights you know, because I, I believe you're going to win, you know, without a doubt. You know, but you had the long nights that you spend, there's always a break in there. And when you first get there, you want to stay there. You want to contribute and everything. Go home, be with your baby, and then come back. And as many times as you can bring him up on the hill that he can see you doing what you're doing, it'll be the best thing you can invest in with your family. Yeah. That's beautiful. Okay. That is beautiful. Wow. I want to take some of that advice too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Akeo Abdul Samad and Rob Johnson for joining us today and sharing your stories. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Us. Thank you. We'll skip our book recommendations um, this time only because I feel like these two gentlemen's lives are an open book. So if you want to, to know more about them, follow them and um, follow their journeys. And we look forward to whatever comes next. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. To my listeners, I have learned so much from Akeo's experiences and his enduring commitment to change and community empowerment. As he moves forward into the next part of his life, I know his legacy will continue to influence and inspire. And to learn more about Rob Johnson's campaign, visit robjohnsonforiowa.com. Subscribe, like, and share. Find Black and Privileged in America podcast on www.amplifydsm.com and my website, abanasankofa.com. Stay engaged. Stay curious. Keep striving. Thanks for listening. Until next time.